persuasion and coercion. Say 83. We tend today to exaggerate the effectiveness of persuasion as a means of inoculating opinion and shaping behavior. We see in propaganda a, form a formidable instrument. To its skillful use, we attribute many of the startling success of the mass movements of our time, and we have come to fear the world as much as uh, fear the word as much as the sword. Well, actually, the fabulous effects ascribed to propaganda have no greater foundation in the fact that the fall of the walls of Jericho ascribed to the blast of Joshua's trumpets. Were propaganda by itself one tenth as potent as it made out to be, the totalitarian regimes of Russia, Germany, Italy, and Spain would have been mild affairs. They would have been blatant and brazen, but without the ghastly brutality of secret police, concentration camps, and mass extermination. The truth seems to be that propaganda on its own cannot force its way into unwilling minds, neither can it inoculate something wholly new, nor can it keep people persuaded once they have ceased to believe. It penetrates only into minds already open. Rather than instill opinions, it articulates and justifies opinions already present in the minds of its recipients. The gifted propagandist brings to a boil ideas and passions already simmering in the mind of his hearers. He echoes the innermost feelings where opinion is not coerced people where it, where opinion is not coerced, people can be made to believe only in what they already know. Propaganda by itself succeeds mainly with the frustrated, their throbbing fears, hopes and passions crowd at the portals of the sense to get between them and the outside world. They cannot see but what they have already imagined and is music to their own souls they hear in the impassioned words of the propagandist. Indeed, it is easier for the frustrated to detect their own imaginings and hear the echo of their own musings in impassioned double talk as corners or frames than in precise words joined together with faultless logic. Propaganda by itself, however skillful, cannot keep people persuaded once they have ceased to believe. To maintain itself, a mass movement has to order things so that when people no longer believe, they can be made to believe by force. As we shall see later, Station 104, words are essentially instrument in preparing the ground for a mass movement. But once the movement is realized, words, through still useful, cease to play a decisive role. So acknowledge the master propaganda, as Dr. Goebbels admits in an unguarded moment, that a sharp, so quote, a sharp sword must always stand behind propaganda if it is to be really effective. End quote. He also sounds apolog apologetic when he claims that, quote, it cannot be denied that the more can be done with good propaganda than by no propaganda at all. End quote. 84. Contrary to Contrary to what would expect, propaganda becomes more fervent and imp importunate when it operates in conjunction with coercion, when it, has to, when it has to rely on its own effectiveness. Both they who convert and they who are converted by coercion need the fervent conviction that the faith they impose are now forced to adopt as the only true one. Without this conviction, the proselytizing terrorist, who is not vicious to begin with, is likely to feel a criminal and the coerced convert see himself as a coward who prostituted his soul to live. Propaganda thus serves more to justify ourselves than to convince others, and the more reason we have to feel guilty, and the more fervent our propaganda. 85. It's probably as true that violence breeds fanaticism as that fanaticism begets violence. It is often impossible to tell which came first. Both those who employ violence and those subject to it are likely to develop a fanatical state of mind. Furo, F-E-R-R-E-R-O, says of the terrorists of the French Revolution that the more blood they shed, the more they needed to believe in their principles as absolutes. Only the absolute might still absolve them in their own eyes and sustain their desperate energy. They did not spill all that blood because they believed in popular sovereignty as a religious truth. They tried to believe in popular sovereignty as a religious truth because their fear made them spill so much blood. The practice of terror serves the true believer not only to cow and crush his opponent, but also to invigorate and intensify his own belief. Every lynching in our South not only intimidates the Negro, but also invigorates the fanatical conviction of white supremacy. In the case of the coerced, too, violence can beget fanaticism. There is evidence that the coerced convert is often as fanatical as his adherence to the new faith as persuaded convert, and sometimes even more so. It's not always true that he who complies against his will is of his own opinion still. Islam opposed its faith by force, yet the coerced Muslims displayed a devotion to the new faith more ardent than that of the first Arabs engaged in the movement. According to Renan, Islam obtained from its coerced converts a faith ever tending to grow stronger. Fanatical orthodoxy is in all movements a late development. It comes when the movement is in full possession of power and can impose its faith by force as well as by persuasion. Thus coercion when implacable and persistent has an unequal persuasiveness and not only with simple souls but also with those who pride themselves in the strength and integrity of their intellect. 
but an arbitrary decree from the Kremlin forces scientists, writers, and artists to recant their convictions and confess their errors, the chances are that these recantations and confessions represent genuine conversions rather than lip service. It needs fanatical faith to rationalize our cowardice. 86. There's hardly an example of a mass movement achieving vast proportions of a durable organization solely by persuasion. Professor K.S. Lauteret, L-A-T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E, a very Christian historian, has to admit that however incompatible the spirit of Jesus and armed force may be, and however unpleasant it may be to acknowledge, the fact is a matter of plain history. The later has often made it possible for the former to survive. It was the temporal sword that made Christianity a world religion. Conquest and conversion went hand in hand later often serving as a justification and a tool for the former. Where Christianity failed to gain or retain the backing of the state power, it achieved neither a wide nor a permanent hold. In Persia, Christianity confronted a state religion sustained by the crown and never became the faith of more than a minority. In the phenomenal spread of Islam, conquest was a primary factor and conversion a byproduct. The most flourishing periods of Mohammedanism have been at times of its greatest political ascendancy, and it is at those times that it has received its largest accession from without. The Reformation made a headway only where it gained the backing and willing prince of the local government. Said Metzelton, Luther's wife is its lieutenant, without the intervention of the civil authority, what would our precepts become? Platonic laws. Whereas in France the state power was against it, it was drowned in blood and never rose again. In the case of the French Revolution, it was the armies of the Revolution, not the, its ideas, that penetrated throughout the whole of Europe. There was no question of the intellectual contention. The Muirs protested that the French proclaimed the sacred law of liberty, like the Koran, sword in hand. The threat of communism at present does not come from the forcefulness of its preachings, but from the fact that it is backed by one of the mightiest armies on earth. It also seems that where a mass movement can either persuade or coerce, it usually chooses the later. Persuasion is clumsy and its results uncertain, said the Spaniard Saint Dominic in the Herical Abogenesis. For many years I have exhorted you in vain, with gentleness, preaching, praying, and weeping. But according to the proverb of my country, where blessing can accomplish nothing, blows may avail. We shall rouse again against you, princess and prelates, who, alas, will arm nations and kingdoms against this land, and thus blows will avail, where blessings and gentleness have been powerless. 87. The assertion that a mass movement cannot be stopped by force is not literally true. Force can stop and crush even the most vigorous movement, but to do so, the force must be ruthless and persistent, and here is where faith enters an indispensable factor, for a persecution that is ruthless and persistent can come only from fanatical conviction. Any violence which does not spring from a firm spiritual base will be wavering and uncertain. It lacks the stability which can only rest in the fanatical outlook. Paraphrasing Hitler. The terrorism which emanates from the individual brutality neither goes far enough nor lasts long enough it is a spastic subject to moods and hesitations. But as soon as force wavers and alienate and alternates with forbiddance, not only will the doctrine to be repressed recover again and again but it will also be in position to draw new benefit from every persecution the holy terror only knows no limit and never flags thus it seems that we need ardent faith not only to be able to resist coercion but also to be able to exercise it effectively 88 whence comes the impulse to proselytize intensity of conviction is not the main factor which impels a movement to spread its faith to the four corners of the earth religions of great intensity often confine themselves to content contaminating, destroying, or at best pitying what is not themselves. Nor is the impulse to proselytize an expression of an overabundance of power which, as Beacon has it, is like a great flood that will be sure to overflow. The missionary zeal seems rather an expression of some deep misgiving, some pressing feeling of insufficiency at the center. Proselytizing is more a passionate search for something not yet found than a desire to bestow upon the world something we already have. It is a search for a final and irrefutable demonstration that our absolute truth is indeed the one and only truth. The apostolicizing fanatic strengthens his own faith by converting others. A creed whose legitimacy is most easily challenged is likely to develop the strongest apostolicizing impulse. It is doubtful whether a movement which does not profess some preposterous and paternally irrational dogma can be possessed of the, that zealous drive which must either win 
men or destroy the world. It is also plausible that those movements with the greatest inner contradiction between profession and practice, that is to say with a strong feeling of guilt, are likely to, the bo are likely to be the most fervent, fervent in imposing their faith on others. The more unworkable communism proves in Russia, the more its leaders are compelled to compromise and elder to the original creed. The more brazen and arrogant will be their attack on the non-believing world. The slaveholders of the South became more aggressive in spreading their way of life, the more it became patent that their position was unattainable in the modern world. If free enterprise becomes a proselytizing holy cause, it will be a sign that its workability and advantages have ceased to be self-evident. The passion for proselytizing and the passion for world dominion are both perhaps symptoms of some serious deficiency at the center. It is probably as true as a band of apostles or conquistadors as it is of a band of fugitives setting out for a distant land that they escape from an unattainable situation at home and how often indeed do three meet, mingle and exchange their parts. Leadership 89 no matter how vital we think the role of leadership is in the rise of a mass movement, there is no doubt that the leader cannot create the conditions which make the rise of a movement possible. He cannot conjure a movement out of the void. There has to be an eagerness to follow and obey, an intense dissatisfaction with the things as they are, before movement and leader can make their appearance. When conditions are not ripe, the potential leader, no matter how gifted and his holy cause, no matter how potent, remain without a following. The First World War and its aftermath readied the ground for the rise of the Bolshevik, Fascist, and Nazi movements. Had the war been averted or postponed a decade or two, the fate of Lenin, Mussolini, and Hitler would not have been different uh, from that of the brilliant plotters and agitators of the 19th century who never succeeded in ripening the frequent disorders and crises of their time into full-scale mass movements. Something was lacking. European masses, up to the cataclysmic events of the First World War, had not utterly despaired of the present and were therefore not willing to sacrifice it for a new life in a new world. Even the nationalist leaders, who fared better than the revolutionists, did not succeed in making of nationalism the popular holy cause it has become since. Militant nationalism and militant revolutionism seems to be contemporaneous. C-O-N-T-E-M-P-O-R-A-N-E-O-U-S As in contemporaries. In Britain, too, the leader had to wait for the times to ripen before he could play his role. During the 1930s, the potential leader, Churchill, was prominent in the eyes of the people and made himself heard, day in, day out. But the will to follow was not there. It was only when disaster shook the country and its foundation and made autonomous individual lives unattainable and meaningless that the leader came into his own. There is a period of waiting in the wings, often a very long period for all great leaders whose entrance on the scene seems to us a most crucial point in the course of a mass movement. Accidents and the activities of other men have to set the stage for them before they can enter and start their performance. The commanding man in a momentous day seems only to be the last accident in a series. 90. Once the stage is set, the presence of an outstanding leader is indispensable. Without him, there will be no movement. The rightness of the times does not automatically produce a mass movement, nor can elections, laws, and administrative bureaus hatch one. It was Lenin who forced the flow of events into the channels of the Bolshevik Revolution. Had he died in Switzerland, or on his way to Russia in 1917, it was almost certain that the other prominent Bolsheviks would have joined a coalition government. The result might have been a more or less liberal republic, run chiefly by the Brogueries. In the case of Mussolini and Hitler, the evidence is even more decisive. Without them, there would have been neither a fascist nor a Nazi movement. Events in England at the same moment also demonstrate the indispensability of a gifted leader for the crystallization of a mass movement. A genuine leader, a socialist Churchill, at the head of the labor government, would have initiated drastic reforms of nationalization in the fervent atmosphere of a mass movement and not in the undramatic drabness of a socialist austerity. He would have cast the British worker in the role of the heroic producer and that of a pioneer in truly scientific industrialization. He would have made the British feel that their chief task is to show the whole world, and America, and Russia in particular, what a truly civilized nation can do with modern methods of production, and free alike from the confusion, waste, and greed of capitalist management, and from the Byzantinism, barbarism, and ignorance of a Bolshevik bureaucracy. He would have known how to infuse the British people with the same pride and hope which sustained them in the darkest hours of the war. Excuse me. 
and he's there in will, daring in vision, and an exceptional leader to concert and mobilize existing attitudes and impulses into the collective jive of mass movement. The leader personifies the certitude of the creed and the defiance and grandeur of power. Your 